here. You mentioned once that, or at least at least once, that art's parts will levitate in the presence of a certain magnetic field, and I'm assuming that's at room temperature. Now, what makes you say this? Where did you get that from? The bismuth magnesium zinc layered material. It came in two sections. Uh, it was 1996, April, and I was doing uh, probably two, two to three programs with Art Bell almost every month at that time. And the first shipment ca came with a metal that I got to Alcoa aluminum to find out what it was because we figured it was aluminum and Alcoa came back and said, where did you get this? It's 99.74% pure aluminum and we don't manufacture aluminum at this purity. And then within two or three weeks after getting the aluminum and my starting the research and reporting pretty much pretty regularly with art on coast to coast and another show we did called Dreamland came another shipment. And by then I had established with uh, a professor that I knew through crop circle investigations at the University of Michigan. We got a second box and it was clearly more complex, layered pieces, silver on one side, black on the other. And I called the professor at the University of Michigan and said, we've got a second box can you take a look at a piece I'm going to send you and see if we can get elements, uh, do, do some electron microscopy, all of which he could do at the university. That led to, in my books, you see the analysis that it was 97.6% a layer in one of the layers in the silver and black and the 97.6% was magnesium, 2.4% zinc. So it was like an alloy in one layer that was silver. The next layer was only one to four microns. It was extremely thin and it was bismuth. So we had alternating layers of bismuth magnesium with, uh, with a magnesium zinc with bismuth approximately 26 layers making these silver and black pieces that were maybe a little less than a quarter of an inch thick. And there were several in this box. As soon as I began reporting what the professor was finding in terms of the elements, I started getting phone calls and emails from people saying, we know from our research that what you have is uh, going to be from the bottom of a craft. Well, it turned out that we had a letter that came fr uh, from a diary of a, a grandfather who had worked in security at Roswell, according to the sender who was a army sergeant at the time. I got to talk with him on the phone. And he said, my grandfather, uh, said this was in one of the crashes in 47 and that he and men were assigned to ring a wedge-shaped craft that glowed with light underneath for about four hours and essentially that the grandfather left his uh, relative this diary saying that he had done something that would get anybody else in real trouble. He had gone over and with his own hand had pulled some of the bottom that was glowing of this craft. And these are the pieces that were in a box. And so we had the diary that said that the uh, black and silver pieces came from the bottom of a wedge-shaped craft. And eventually within a very short period of time of my reporting these various pieces and questions on the air, what could this be? Hal Putoff, uh, who is a physicist who has worked on many, many UFO related subjects, he got in touch with me and said, Linda, I would like to be able to study this uh, bismuth magnesium zinc material. 
And how put off and people who are working in semiconductors, I started getting requests from a variety of different scientists. And then we started cutting pieces of these originals so that I could send them out with uh, releases that everybody would return what they were studying to me, which is how I kept them for the pieces for 20 years. What I began to uh, realize that from the people who were getting the material and that I was working with, they started talking about, we think that this is material that interacts with a field that would neutralize gravity. That's, that's how all of it, very complex series of tests and reports evolving into people saying this material in a field, but what is the field? We never were able to demonstrate this, never. But that was the context from people who had other information that the bismuth, magnesium, zinc. So now jump to today in 2022. There are all kinds of reports that have been emerging in the last year or two about bismuth and magnesium being one of the keys to certain kinds of skins that have been verified in UFOs that would have some relationship to neutralizing gravity in very specific fields. So that's what's happened from 1996 up to 2022, an evolution of a whole variety of researchers. And now today, there are people who are willing to say that. I was looking into the research on this and I couldn't find any published research, only reports of other people like Hal put off saying, well, it, it, right. it displays anti-gravitic properties. However, a published piece of research was by Mick West and he showed that some of the images of the aluminum art parts, they looked like a fin sheet, which is found in car radiators in around the year 19... 25 I don't know so. what you're, re I do not know what you're referring to. I know that uh, my work with a professor at the University of Michigan was the very first work. There, there was no, uh, no other. And that was done. We had electron microscope images. We had uh, microscope images. We were doing periodic table uh, element uh, analyses that led to my uh, talking with Art and saying, look, I would like to find out from somebody who, uh, where we could do um, an um, ion microprobe, which is a very sophisticated instrument, and find out if there is anything in the magnesium that might be outside of what is considered normal magnesium on the earth. And that is one of the elements that had come up in other UFO stories in previous years, where a famous case down in South America, there was a magnesium drop from a UFO onto a beach. And it turned out that one of the reports was that it was not earth-based ratios. Well, that led to Art and I uh, split the, the cost of it. I remember it was an $850 bill and we split it for me to go to Carnegie Institute in Washington, DC that had at that time in July of 1996, the only ion microprobe that would be able to do a study of the magnesium and the bismuth and uh, the, uh, the bismuth, the magnesium and the zinc. And it was about a seven or eight hour that I was there at Carnegie Institute. And at one point, I remember the ion microprobe uh, technical guy said, you know, I don't think in all of my work here, I do not think I've ever looked at a thin bismuth layer like this, one to four microns, where I did not find also lead atoms present because on a periodic table, bismuth and lead are right next to each other. And they would normally find some lead with bismuth. And with regard to that in particular, I'm sorry to interrupt. I just want to hurry this along. So Mick West, in his, and I'm, you're saying that you haven't seen the analysis by Mick West. 
And from my reading of it, it seems like what's been displayed in Art's parts, at least part of it, is, like I mentioned, what can be found in fin sheet and car radiators in the 1920s. And there's a... No. The, the refinement of, of if, lead. If I could just, fin if sure, I could sure, just sure. finish on the ion microprobe, uh, it's the uh, it's the most sophisticated uh, technical apparatus, and we were looking at the purity or the percentage in the bismuth layer, the zinc layer, and the magnesium layer. That's not easy to do. And the ion microprobe that day, when I said it, we, we used it for seven or eight hours, and that uh, when Eric Howery was the ion microprobe technician and he was talking about how the bismuth was pure, that he was not finding lead. And it turned out that the magnesium uh, had 11% more magnesium 24 than our baseline magnesium we were using as a comparison. That wasn't enough to kick it into, this is automatically extraterrestrial magnesium, but it was definitely unusual enough for him. He wrote up a report, which I have published in my books, talked about. So the, the elemental compositions of those layers and knowing that the bismuth was one to four microns, this is very thin making up these layers. This was uh, hard data in the period of time that we were receiving this material in 1996. And that is what I was reporting and finding in the electron microscope and eventually at Carnegie Institute. That is why Hal Putoff and other scientists became very interested. And that began the next level of doing agreements where I would send out some of this magnesium bismuth zinc to them to do tests. And they sending back and saying, this is definitely unusual. This is not some uh, deposition as some people tried to say, oh, it's just a layered deposition from a lab. Not, no, it, that's not true. I had a notebook. I think I ended up at the end of uh, 1996 with 119 people and labs that I had gone to getting information about the bismuth magnesium zinc and it included a man and a, an exotic metals manufacturer in New York City. And when I told him what we had found at the University of Michigan and in Carnegie Institute in terms of what these layers were, I remember the man laughed and said, look, I can tell you, you, you can't put bismuth and magnesium together. They will delaminate. And so, we had, uh, we had the hard evidence of what they were made of and what the layers were and how pure they were. But metal, exotic metal manufacturer couldn't even recognize how you would put bismuth and magnesium together in layers. Have you heard of the better tin Kroll process? Or has anyone mentioned that to you? Say that again. Better tin Kroll. So it was invented around the 1920s and it was a way and it still is a way of refining lead to produce similar amounts of ratios that have been reported. And see, when I watch a show like Forensic Files, sometimes I see, anyone can do this, you can just watch the show Forensic Files. Sometimes you'll see these experts and they'll say, this, I don't know where this came from. This is not even from, this is, and I'm an expert in the field that I've never seen either this isotopic ratio or this amount of percentage of elements in it. And then there's some pedestrian explanation afterward. So even experts can, can miss. So that's why I'm wondering if you've heard of Betterton Kroll. It is a lead analysis process? No, it's a refinement. It's a refinement process that was no. invented around the 1920s or so. No, I mean, you're so far afield from the fundamental original research that was done at the University of Michigan and then Carnegie Institute of pure bismuth in one to four micron layers, and then zinc 2.4%, magnesium 96% given, it has to add up to 100%. And that was repeated at Carnegie Institute. 
So the only elements present in these layers were the bismuth thin one to four micron layer with the magnesium zinc alternating very regularly black bismuth silver magnesium zinc a whole series like a torque cake but only a quarter of an inch high because the layers the bismuth was so thin i understand and those those what i'm saying is that was the 1996 original hard evidence that would hold up in a court of law uh, this is all that is in these layered metals. So what's happening with those metamaterials right now? Are they simply sitting around? Is the Crata agreement going to produce a public analysis of it? I had uh, the metals working with Hal Putoff and with others up to uh, August of 2018. So I started the, of those years in April of 1996, and by 2018, Hal Putoff had joined with Tom DeLong and Lou Elizondo and others in that To The Stars group where they had a goal that they would take, uh, they would have money, raise money to have exotic technologies examined and then reported to the white world as opposed to being constantly covered up in the black world. That was the concept. And Hal uh, put off, asked me in, uh, a, he'd had the bismuth magnesium zinc three different times, had written up uh, his analysis for me that I had reported and is in my books. And Jacques Vallée in 2017, he had a piece of bismuth magnesium zinc from me for most of that year. And by then it was because if you go from 1996 to 2017 to 2018, there had been more and more information about the role that bismuth might play in terms of neutralizing gravity. And so people who had had the bismuth magnesium zinc 20 years earlier were now coming back and saying, we want to study it more for X, Y, and Z. And by that time, Hal Putoff had written to me and said, I would like to see a study of the bismuth magnesium zinc layered material subjected to terahertz frequency. He said, I think that if we could generate terahertz frequency at this specific level, that this could turn into a lifting body. And terahertz frequency had not even been in the discussion in the 90s. It came in those 2017, 2018 years. And it was also associated, terahertz frequency had come up in one of the reports about what might have happened at Bentwaters in England when John Burroughs and others had had encounters with lights and there was a report that was finally released in the 2012-2013 period talking specifically about UFOs emitting terahertz frequency that probably had to do with neutralizing gravity. But what they had learned uh, was that terahertz frequency could damage human hearts or organs that had spaces in them like a heart does at certain levels and frequencies of terahertz that had never been reported prior to 2012 and 13. So coming up even further to 2017 and 2018, Hal had the bismuth magnesium zinc, wanted to try to see if he could get terahertz frequency and they had done tests and they had not been able to generate the terahertz frequency that he wanted. Jacques Vallée had a company on the West Coast. They said they thought they could generate the terahertz frequency. All of the year of 2017, Jacques had trying and they couldn't. Then by then, uh, to the stars, the group that included Hal Putoff, they came to me and said, we have uh, a variety of interests, including other scientists who 
have information and we would like to be able to work with you as you have with Hal and with Jacques and others. And we will have a piece of bismuth, magnesium, zinc, and we will return it to you because we're now going to try to see if we can match Hal's uh, projection that if we got terahertz frequencies at a very high level, it could turn into a lifting body. And long story, yeah, long story short, it's been going through all these different rounds of research and being returned to me. And I got a call in the spring of 2018 after To The Stars had gotten a piece that was to come back to me. And they said, we still have not been able to find a civilian commercial lab that can project the terahertz frequency at the level we need. But the United States Army is interested. Linda, we can make you a third party to the stars and me and the army, but we need to be able with your agreement because all these agreements were with me to keep returning the pieces to me over all these years, that if you want to be a third party, we want to send the bismuth magnesium zinc layered piece to the army because they think that they can generate the terahertz frequency. And I asked them, could I think about it for 24 hours? And I thought, if anybody ends up in an agreement with any of the military branches of the United States, I could not really foresee a, the peace coming back to me. And that's why I proposed that they sell it to me for all of the costs that I had incurred from 1996 to 2018, which was considerable. I traveled, I flew, I took that. So, so a sales officially on one piece, I still have another piece, went from me to, uh, to the stars and they delivered the piece to the United States Army, which I am assuming it is still there but they're up to now, as you and I are speaking in January of 2022, I have not heard of any breakthrough on testing the material with terahertz and it turning into an, uh, a body that would float. If it has, they're keeping it close to their chest. I personally have no doubt that a physicist in 2014 at a conference who came to me and said, with a lot of noise around, which was protective, he said, I just want you to know in the 1970s at Area 51, S4 underground, he said, I worked on the layered bismuth and magnesium zinc material. This is in 2014. At S4. This is before everything oh, I just finished. the same finished. place that Bob Lazar supposedly yes. worked. And, and this physicist showed me proof that I cannot discuss about what he had done and where he had been. And he said, I had a piece of the bismuth magnesium zinc that was three feet by six feet, Linda. It came off, it was a skin of a wedge-shaped UFO. The diary that came to Art Bell and me in 1996 was typed that this was uh, pulled off of the bottom skin of a wedge-shaped vehicle. Now the physicist is telling me that he had worked with a three foot by six foot piece and that its function was to be in parallel with a pure aluminum, remember that was the first shipment. The first shipment we got in April of 1996 was an aluminum that Alcoa called me up yep. and said, where did you get this? It was 97.6 or something percent pure aluminum. And uh, Alcoa said, we don't manufacture in this kind of purity. And the physicist is the one who opened up for me why and why these two would have come in the different boxes from the grandfather. The physicist said, 
what we learned at Area 51 S4 is that it was the pure aluminum that had iridium placed atomically in it, something we cannot do. And it had a, the pure aluminum was the outside skin, Linda. The bismuth magnesium zinc layered was an inside skin. The two skins of the wedge-shaped objects then in some sort of creation or projection of the terahertz frequency by the craft with those two skins would turn it into a lifting body. That was from a physicist who proved to me who he was, who approached me in 2014. So this is a complicated timeline from 1996 getting the physical pieces the physicist in 2014 telling me what he was able to study and confirm at area uh, 51 S4, and then getting to the year 2017 and 2018, where Jacques Vallée and Hal Putoff and To the Stars wanted to study also for the same reason, terahertz frequency mixed with that material could turn it into a lifting body. But as we speak in January of 2022, no one yet has publicly published anything confirming that they have done that. I know that you don't know much about my background, Linda. I, I'm fairly naive in this subject. Uh, my, my knowledge is so rudimentary and there's so many names and so many places. It's difficult for me to contextualize and make sense. So if my questions are come across as, as rude, please forgive me. It's just my... <laughs> my innocuous naivety. Okay, so well, here's what I, I'm- I sent you my book so you could see the photographs and on the bismuth magnesium. And I will include a link to all of the books and what you've sent me in the description for people who would like to check them out. So here's what I'm wondering. When you sold the materials to Tom DeLong, it sounds like you were aware he was working with the government. However, the government- Oh, I was known. told. Okay, I was great. Told. However, we believe the government to be covering up evidence on this topic. So I'm curious, how did you feel about that? And also, if I go like this, again, I'm not trying to be rude. I'm just saying like, okay, we have to wrap this up because there's so, we have a significant amount yeah. of ground to cover. But I I, I'll just go like, like this it, instead. But I felt like it was unclear on your side and I wanted to make sure that it was clear because this is really important. This material is very, very important. Okay, so how did you feel about that you gave it to someone who was working with the government when we're ambivalent about the government, given that they- I was, uh, yeah, it, w it was a, a kind of sad irony that from 1996 to 2018, 2018, that I had uh, shepherded these materials all of those years and had gone to various labs and had worked with even Stephen Chu, the uh, inventor of the, the super semiconductor. And people were looking at it for all kinds of various reasons, not just UFOs uh, and a lifting body. There were lots of scientists very interested in the layered combination. And when Jacques, had been so enthusiastic and in 2017 thought that they were going to be able to generate the terahertz that Hal had calculated and they weren't. And Hal came back and said, we now think we have a lab. It was very clear that the test of the terahertz frequencies at frequencies very near flipping into the frequency of light. Terahertz, look at an electromagnetic spectrum, terahertz, goes right into UV light. And so the, it was an issue of how do you control a certain high frequency of terahertz and direct it into the bismuth magnesium zinc without it flipping into the light frequency. That's, as I understand, was one of the problems. And so if Jacques Vallée and Hal Putoff had not been able to get the terahertz frequency tests done, and to the stars comes and says, the United States Army thinks that they can do it now. There is a conflict that I had shepherded this material for a very long time, but there was also the realism 
I don't have the ability to generate terahertz frequencies. I don't have labs in which they, I can go into an electron microscopic level. I always was trying to get that to people who would report results. So it seemed to me that it was just a final practical answer that I would sell a piece keeping another piece. I see, I see. And if the United States Army could solve this, it's my country. This is for our uh, United States of America, if in fact they can crack uh, what this skin and the two skins and terahertz frequencies might produce, that it was had come to sort of the end of the road of what to do next, because Hal Putoff and Jacques Vallée were two scientists that seemed like they might have a reasonable chance of getting the, the test done, and then it would have been reported publicly. But it, if I had kept the peace, because I didn't want it going to a military operation, what would I do with it if the major researchers like Hal and Jacques had come to a, a dead end at that point? So that was part of my thinking.